See, I'm just gonna ride the wave until the morning sun. If I just speak into existence, it's already done. It's already done. It's already done. If I just speak into existence, it's already done. Sissy Mary Sue Education Fund, a nonprofit 501c3, presents our podcast featuring inclusive voices. Welcome to our podcast called Educating Empathy. Thank you for joining us today. And gosh, we hope that you enjoy the journey with us. Welcome to Educating Empathy. I'm Dr. Wendy Mulhauser, and I am just thrilled today to have uh, Dr. Anton Troyer uh, with us on this episode. Thank you. Welcome, Dr. Troyer. Thanks for having me. Uh, so we just have an hour today uh, mm -hmm. together. Who? Let me. I have a. I have just um, housekeeping questions. So, how old is your oldest child now? Oldest one's twenty nine. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Okay, my son's twenty seven. So we're we're parents with the same age child almost. And then your youngest with your wife. 10. Okay. Oh my gosh. Cause you have, I think you have nine kids, correct? Right. Yeah. Wow. Like cover the whole spread of ages in between. Oh my gosh. That's so awesome. I I'm so thrilled about this. We were chatting before we began about how we met and we met at a book, um, a book reading of yours called the assassination of hole in the day. I was so captivated by your writing, your, uh, your passion uh, with revitalizing the Ojibwe language and the culture. I wanted to uh, have you speak, if you could, for us about your history, for us to get a little glimpse into your upbringing to begin with. You know, I find myself a pretty unlikely candidate to have much to say at all about the Ojibwe language and culture. And there are a number of reasons for that. First of all, my father is not Ojibwe at all. He was actually born across the ocean in Vienna, Austria, and spoke nothing but German the first 13 years of his life. He was a Holocaust survivor uh, and eventually made his way to Minnesota, met my mom, and here I am. Although because of that, you know, he had great German skills, great English skills, and he did not have great Ojibwe language skills. So English was the language of the home. My mother, for very different reasons, also, you know, ran the house in English. So her mother, who was, you know, a speaker of Ojibwe, was taken from her parents as a very small child, sent to residential boarding school, uh, and raised in institutions, you know, but made her way out back to our ancestral village where my mother was raised but it still generated an intergenerational break in the transmission of our language and culture. And although my mother always held on to many parts of our culture, you know, they were avid, you know, hunters, um, rice harvesters, things like that. Sure. And she brought us around a lot of ceremonies. Uh, the language was something that I ended up going after later in life. So I got, got exposure as a kid being, brought around to ceremonies and things like that. But uh, it was really, I think when I finished high school, my goal was to get out of town and never come back. And once I did that, my yeah. goal was to come home and never leave. And I, I did that probably freaking my parents out because <laughs> I ended up going to Princeton University, graduated and said, I'm not taking a job. I'm not going to graduate school. I'm going to walk the earth. I'm going to hang out with my elders. I'm going to learn about my language and culture. And they said, wow. well, that sounds beautiful. Good luck with that because we're done paying for it. And, uh, <laughs> and I did. And I did. I, uh, I ended up, this is pre-cell phone era. And mm -hmm. I drove over to Balsam Lake, which is on the St. Croix Reservation, right on the Minnesota-Wisconsin border. And I wanted to connect with Archie Mose, who is this famous spiritual leader. And he was born in 1901, but he was 12, the first time he ever even saw a white man. And wow. he was in his 30s, first time he saw a black man or a car. And when I met him, 
He was in a little modern house watching WWF SmackDown on a TV, <laughs> laughing really loud. Oh my and gosh. I came in and he shut off the TV and he said, oh, I've been waiting for you. And I remember thinking, well, how could you be waiting for me? You don't even know who I am. But he had a dream about someone. I looked like this person from his dream. And he just kind of opened the door to me after that. I lived on his couch. I drove him around to ceremonies and funerals. Wow. Yeah. And I kind of, as a result, without really planning it that way, ended up with an immersive experience in our language and culture. And for me, it's kind of like Forrest Gump when he figured out how to run. After that, every time he went somewhere, he was running. He never thought it would take him anywhere, but it did. And I, I kind of felt like that with my language yeah. culture journey that I just wanted to be in the room, not thinking it would take me anywhere, but it sure. Did. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That's incredible. I, wow. I, I, gosh. I mean, I, it, oh gosh. That's just, it's really fascinating how things happen when, when we sincerely care about something um, and we're committed to it, but we don't have an idea of the outcome. Uh, we're just sincere in the moments. And it sounds like you were sincere in each of those moments uh, that, that became a, a pivot point. Uh, so let's continue on with that. And let's talk about then you you know you said that you didn't want to do any masters or any um, any advanced study. Uh, tell me then, how did you come to go to the University of Minnesota? And I think that you got your master's degree and your doctorate there. But was it that you were learning? I, I love the story that you told me before about labeling everything in kitchens and in a house with Ojibwe uh, vocabulary. Uh, were you doing that first before you did your master's? Help us out with the, that next part of this. Yeah. Well. You know, first of all, with anything, you know, there is such a thing, like, I felt like this when my children were born. It was like, love at first sight, you know, yeah. I thought I'd make all kinds of sacrifices or help other people out. But then all of a sudden, I knew I could jump in front of a speeding train for someone or whatever, you know, but, you know, there's another side to that as well, which is that when we invest time, and caring and effort and energy into something, we grow to love it more and more and more. And right. so, you know, I think for me, some of the, I was sparked, lit on fire, you know, in my early experiences with Archie, you know, not just our personal relationship, but around ceremony and so many other things, you know, that had me spending a lot more time and it just grew deeper and deeper. So right. uh, my parents were right. Like eventually I just ran out of money and had to figure things out. You know, yeah. I did, did take a job. Um, also, you know, I was happy to fill all my time with Archie, but, you know, he had other things too. And, and sure. <laughs> so I, you know, I ended up um, taking a job back home uh, at Bemidji State University. And that was just in student support. I was a student, you know, Native American retention counselor. I've started taking Ojibwe classes and yes, I was actively studying the language and labeling everything in the house and typing notes and recording elders and starting to transcribe and translate. And I, I think those things helped me a lot with the, my language journey as well. And, <clears throat> you know, eventually, of course, I had to think about a career and a long-term plan. And so I, I chose the University of Minnesota, so I didn't have to leave Ojibwe country to do it. Sure. But my goal was to study history and kind of use our language to do oral history. And that led me to the assassination of Hole in the Day. It started out as my dissertation when I was a grad student. Nice. And then, you know, I ended up editing a native language journal, the Oshka Bewis Native Journal. And that had me recording and transcribing and translating more with a lot of great speakers. And some of that came out in you know another book and other kinds of publications and then the web of connections, I'm still doing that kind of work, so. Nice, nice. Can you share more about that? I have that as a question. Can you verbalize what the titles of the books are that you've done? And maybe they're too plentiful to say, but I'd love to hear all of them. Yeah, I, there's 20 of them now. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, but they're kind of in different fields. So some of okay. the works are works of history. So that's my formal training, the assassination of Hole in the Day, and um, Warrior Nation, uh, a history of the Red Lake Ojibwe, are, are major history books, but some of them are language. So there might be 
stories, childhood reminiscences, um, oral histories, and some of those are published in Ojibwe with English translation. And then, you know, some of my works too are kind of, you know, broad, very accessible general reader books. So everything you wanted to know about Indians, but were afraid to ask, or nice. um, actually more recently, the Language Warriors Manifesto, How to Keep Our Languages Alive No Matter the Odds, really speaks to the conversation we're having today, which is, you know, kind of answering the questions, why are languages important and what's in the way? Right. How did I do it? And then there's a collective journey for how we did it with making immersion schools and things like that. And then there's a kind of a partner book that just came out called The Cultural Toolbox, Traditional Ojibwe Living in the Modern World, which is about, you know, my cultural journey and the stories of our family as a window into how one family tries to live Ojibwe culture. And to me, language and culture are kind of like the left and right hand. They're both connected, um, even though there's some things distinct about each. And Absolutely. so, yeah, some of the works are like that. And then, you know, I, I continue to do the language work. So some of the, you know, work is bilingual and some of it is monolingual Ojibwe publications. So recently over the past few years, been working with a cohort of speakers in Mille Lacs, developing Ojibwe books with them and nice. launching Rosetta Stone for Ojibwe and things like that. Oh my gosh, so cool. Okay, this is just so fascinating. I want to back up for a second and talk about the immersion schools. Uh, and then before I forget, I'm going to plant this seed <clears throat> and ask you to speak about helping to infuse Minnesota curriculum with the Ojibwe history. Uh, but but let's first talk, well, you can talk about either one you want to, um, but I, I'd really love to hear about the immersion school uh, more, and I know the listeners would too. Uh, and I think that ties into what you just said um, with that combination of culture and and learning and language and and just that we're all that so many aspects of us as human beings are are interwoven and yet we're not allowed to uh, to be that enough. So if you want to speak to the immersion schools, that would be wonderful. Sure. So first of all, I think people have a pretty broad awareness that we're at a tough time in human history, a decline in animal populations related to climate change and things like that. That in many ways, humans are playing Jenga with Mother Earth. Every time we pull yes. a species out for extinction, it's like pulling a block out of the Jenga tower. Yes. And eventually the whole you know, ecosystem can come crashing okay. down. You get trophic cascade. <clears throat> That's more commonly known. What's less commonly known is that we are also playing Jenga with bodies of human knowledge and ways of knowing. Yes, we have gotten ever more narrow in the modalities and kinds of knowledge that are valued, shared, and commonly accessed. So right. we get information through the scientific method, almost to the exclusion of many other ways. Right. Uh, and some of this is reflected in the language landscape. So right now, there are almost 7,000 languages spoken on the planet. But 2,500 are gravely endangered, spoken by a tiny handful of people, and many others are in varying states of, you know, decay. Right. Only about 100 languages are actively and widely taught at colleges and universities. Yes. 7,000. Wow. So people, you know, might not realize this, but the best predictor of the language that a child will have is not the language of their parents, and it is not the language of their teacher. It is actually the language of their peers, wow. which is why yeah. if somebody, you know, immigrates from a place where the language, like to America, from a place where the language is not English, the parents will speak that heritage language at home with each other and with their children. The children will grow up and going to school in an English medium school will speak that heritage language in English. But when they get married and start raising their children, the language of the home will often shift to English mm -hmm. and pure language is entirely in English. And so it's only two generations to break down a living language in a family. Wow, that's profound. 
Yeah, it's it's troubling. And of course, there are many heroic examples of people who have kept it alive longer than two generations. But it requires some heroism and some struggle to do that. You know, like in my area here, northern Minnesota, lots of Scandinavian farmers. I used to work for Albert Swenson. He was a Norwegian farmer and roll hay bales and stuff like that. And, you know, he, because his parents, you know, spoke Norwegian at home, was a good Norwegian speaker, you know, yeah. and his wife could not speak Norwegian, even though she was also of Scandinavian heritage. And so <laughs> the language of the home was English and the kids only spoke English. Sure. When he went to like, you know, the precinct caucuses, he'd find a bunch of other Norwegian farmers and they'd sit down and caucus in Norwegian. And he, <laughs> you know, he missed that. And that was very American and very Minnesotan. I right. think today if somebody wanted to use a language other than English at precinct caucuses, someone else might be upset. Absolutely. Right. And so there's, there's a shift in attitudes about things too. But the way to get the peer language to be the target language, the one you want to teach them, is immersion. Yes. So when you do that, what happens, it's not just, you know, an academic tool for in the classroom, but it's more successful than a lot of other models at getting the kids hollering at each other in the target language on the playground. <laughs> there you go. And yeah. so, so it has right. a lot of promise. And um, seeing both the academic studies and science behind this, as well as its social functions, this is what the Maori did when they revitalized yes their language, um, what the Hawaiians have been doing and the efforts to revitalize theirs. And there are a couple of the really shining success stories. And then, you know, we wanted to do that too. So we started working on some immersion schools and there's, there are a number of them now, I would say maybe 20 or so Ojibwe immersion schools, but wow. a lot of them are early childhood programs. They're not okay. all the way from kindergarten through high school. Okay. Um, so it's an emerging effort. So I'm on the school board at Waduku Dading, which is kind of the flagship Ojibwe immersion school in Wisconsin. Okay. And, um, you know, there are all kinds of challenges and barriers, but we're seeing some really exciting success in their academic performance and their acquisition of Ojibwe as well. So I, I believe in that model. Um, as anything, there are best practices and ways to do it right and ways to go sideways and, you know, have it fall apart. But sure. um, I, I think that model shows a lot of promise for a lot of reasons. Yes. And I'm just excited to see it starting to go on the Canadian side. It, there's an in, interesting political development there because they had their truth and reconciliation commission, which had formal findings that the Canadian government engaged in genocide against native people as part of restorative justice practices, they're devoting a lot more money to indigenous language revitalization and things like that. Really? So, yeah. So there's some exciting stuff that is also just emerging there that um, I think may really strengthen us in the long run um, as you know, people are just starting to take advantage of it. But I would I would say the potential is pretty significant. Yes. That's just that's just fantastic. I uh, I teach online uh, oftentimes to uh, to schools in uh, in Canada uh, with large indigenous populations, and that's that's been really quite special. I wanted to go back um, to have you speak about. I think you shared this with me before that there's certain vocabulary and certain ways of communicating in Ojibwe uh, that gets uh, points across that are uniquely in that language um, that that have to do with preserving Earth and the respect for nature. Do you want to speak a little bit to that? Sure. Well, first of all, every language embodies the unique worldview of a people. And the language doesn't just embody its worldview, it shapes its worldview. Sure. So, um, you know, I think all languages are beautiful and all worldviews are really interesting and beautiful too. And I um, have a lot of appreciation for the ones that I've been privileged to study. But ultimately, in a language like Ojibwe, those smallest meaningful parts of words also tend to be known more commonly to everyday speakers of Ojibwe. 
And so when you're communicating, there's a word and then there's its deeper meaning and they're both coming across in everyday conversation. So I, sure. I think it's especially strong there. A couple examples would be, you know, in our language, our word for an elder, gichiaya'a, literally means great being. Aww. Our word for an elderly woman, mindumuye, means one who holds things together and wow. describes the role of the family matriarch. In English, you got words like old woman, elderly woman, aged woman, you know? Right. And then derogatory words. Yes. Uh, whatever. And yes. So I would say the English speaking world tends to be kind of ageist. Yes. And as a result, and this intersect, there's an intersection with ageism and sexism. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the message to women is, you know, try to be 20 forever right. or pretend that you are. Right. You know, facelift, Botox injection, <laughs> dye your hair and don't admit how old you really are. Right. You know? And in Ojibwe, it's just very different, like mm -hmm. something to look forward to with each phase of life, because you're going to get more yes. respect the older you get. And there, it's built in with, you know, idioms and other things in the language too. Like someone does a good deed for one of their elders, they might touch their head and touch the kid's head and say, like, I'm giving you a white hair. Like, it's a blessing. It's like saying, honoring you, wisdom. Yeah, you get to be an elder too. You're going to get there yes. one good deed at a time. Keep doing your chores. Yes. You know, something like that. And wow. um, yeah, and there are many other things that kind of reflect that value. Mm -hmm. But it's not just the serious or ceremonial things too. It's, you know, even just silly things. I think Ojibwe people thought pants were hilarious when people showed up wearing pants. Really? Yeah. Because people had like a breech cloth and leggings or sure, sure, sure. yeah. Like, but it's cold out there. Yeah. Look at these people, they got to take the whole works down to go to the bathroom. <laughs> you know? And so uh, Love it. they called them, you know, gibudie guasanug. So it's like leggings that sew up the hind end. Oh, so, funny. You know, That's I, wear, funny. I wear pants pretty much every day, but the words still get you a little chuckle, you know. Yeah. And so sure. it, it's just, you know, little snippets of worldview and every little word you could use from the fun to the serious and sure. uh, certainly the major cultural concepts, the importance of names, clans, things like that come across yes. in the language. Yes. yes, for sure. Let's, um, gosh, it's just so fun to listen to you elaborate. Uh, let's let's back up and, and I'd love to hear more specifics about what it was like for you to help the curriculum include Ojibwe. Uh, that wasn't an easy feat. That I'm sure that took quite a long time. Can you talk to me about the arc of that and the experience of that? Yeah, well, there are kind of multiple dimensions to this one. So, sure. <laughs> you know, first of all, for everybody who's involved in education, one of the great frustrations for teachers is trying to hit the moving target that is the state standards for every state in the U.S. Right. And you know, that can be hard because somebody's always changing the rule book that you're trying to operate with. Yes. At the same time, it's that ongoing process provides an opportunity to evolve what we do and how we expect people to do it so that we can serve the kids that we are all about all the That's better. Right. And for most of American history and even still at this current time, our schools do a pretty good job of empowering white students to know who they are, to know about how white people help make America and the world a great place, and don't do such a great job of empowering everybody else. Yes. But we, I mean, we don't want a school system that's a white empowerment program. So we have to do better at right. helping everybody understand who they are right. and the, rest of the world. So there's a need for evolving the standards. And this is an ongoing conversation, you know, here in Minnesota. <clears throat> it's a testy conversation. We are a purple state, and it's not just because of Prince. Uh, <laughs> our, our politics is very divided. We have a divided legislature, you know, House of Representatives controlled by Democrats, Senate controlled by Republicans. That's our state legislature, not just the national one. Yes. And, you know, that just makes it difficult to for for either side to run away with the agenda but also difficult to really advance things because obstruction is part of the game 
Yes. So that's often bogs down and politicizes our educational decision making in yeah. a, in this place. And I really believe that educators are going to know better than politicians how to educate kids, but that's Agreed. not the way the system works. In spite of that, um, there has been some effort and, and there have been some successes in getting Native American stuff infused in state standards in places like Minnesota. So here you will see it in like, you know, sixth grade literature standards, the eighth grade social studies standards, um, where there are, you know, very specific, you know, standards that say students will know, you know, X, Y, and Z, or they will read a book by a Minnesota indigenous person in sixth grade, you know, things like that. And so, nice. you know, those things are starting to change the, the landscape a little bit. By the way, this is not just a Democrat Republican thing to improve the standards. So right. there are states like Montana, which is a pretty Republican place that has adopted indigenous education for all and have a whole thread running all the way through their state standards. Fantastic. You know, Alaska has done this too, another pretty conservative place <laughs> politically. And they have a standalone set of, you know, Alaska native language and culture standards. And so, you know, some places are, are doing some pretty cool things. And I don't think we have to make it political. You know, we just need to think about what do the kids need? That's and, right. And, you know, that part is an ongoing effort. And of course, we need, you know, educators and everybody else to lean into that and say, hey, we do want everybody here to know about themselves. And we want everybody, including our white students, to be able to operate in a world that we know will be very diverse. So they should know about this stuff too. It'll be a great blessing for them. That's right. And, and that's slowly starting to happen, although we would love to have much more engagement there. As part of this, we're also trying to create not just standards and guidance in the standards, but curricular tools and resources that can make it ever easier for teachers to do that. So, you know, there are many ways that this work's being approached. I, the Minnesota Partnership for Collaborative Curriculum is one that comes to mind. The vision there is we keep buying our books from Texas and California. Right. People who've hardly even been to our state and don't speak to anything locally specific. And, you know, we should actually do something very different. Let's build, build our own curriculum. And if we publish it for free with a Creative Commons license, anybody yes. can pick it and use it, then eventually, not only will we not have to buy books from Texas and California, school districts won't have to buy books. Yes. Saving them millions of dollars that can be repurposed for other critical important parts of the agenda. So wow. ongoing um, here, there are probably you know, 80 some districts that have signed on with the Partnership for Collaborative Curriculum. Uh, that's also an ongoing kind of resource development thing. And wow. for your listeners, you know, I know there are a lot of educators who tune into this podcast. They're always looking to hire people um, to do some moonlighting work in the summer months um, and whatnot. Um, they do have some standards. They want Minnesota licensed K-12 educators to do the curricular development part. So that's a stamp of authentication that they you know, sure. ask their, their creators to be. But um, you know, beyond that is pretty open nice. and so trying to develop, you know, and, and are especially searching for people from marginalized or underrepresented groups who can help with the creative parts. Absolutely. To inform it further. Right. Yeah. And so, you know, separate from that, but kind of parallel to it, you know, I was doing some work in the community of Mille Lacs where, you know, three years ago, I got called to this crazy meeting. They, and they said, okay, we've got some overages from grants, um, but you know, we really want to do something on language. And we're wondering how you'd advise us on this stuff. I said, well, how much are your overages? And I said, well, there's, it's about $14 million. So I just well, spit my teeth out. Wow. I said, listen, you're not going to have an opportunity like this very often. I, here's what I would recommend. And I had a whole list of things I bet. looked around and they're like, you know, let's do all of it. No way. So, yeah. So uh, they had oh. identified t only 25 fluent first speakers of Ojibwe okay. in Mille Lacs. Okay. 
you know, which is a very small number and they're all elders. 25. Yep. And I said, uh, they're not going to be able to like teach every kid for the next 30 years, you know, like, um, so let's do some other things to build some tools and resources. And I said, let's do Rosetta Stone. Yes. Uh, we'll push to an app on somebody's phone or computer. Um, they can study the language anywhere in the world. They'll have access to all of this, these people and knowledge. Um, let's wow. kids books. You know, when somebody learns English, there's 5,000 books loaded in a, an accelerated reader program with assessments at a kiosk on a computer in every classroom. So we should be able to teach people literacy in Ojibwe with the same sort of tools. That's so right. Going on the 5,000 books, you know. That's and, right. Uh, and they said, okay, so, so we got cracking. And year one of Rosetta Stone came out in March of 2022. Wow. Year two gets released in 2023. Oh my gosh. Year every year for the next six years until they've got, you know, a major six year development for Ojibwe. And just the teacher guide alone for year one is like 500 pages. So it's, it's a hefty undertaking. Incredible. And then, yeah. And then the books, our first five Ojibwe kids books came out. And uh, they're kind of young reader level books. They're not, you know, like one word per page. They're a lot more substantive. Some sure. of the others wanted to do reminiscences or tell funny stories or do different things. So we kind of, you know, piled them up in different categories and did different books for each. Nice. So uh, what's really cool now is those 25 elders, you know, are set up to teach people for hundreds of years to come. Oh my gosh, that is absolutely incredible. It was it was such great foresight to, to know that and to understand that that resource was finite, that they weren't going to be living forever. And you had to find a way that fit into this time and space. So technology, Rosetta Stone, wow, that's incredible. Yeah, it was, you know, and it's it's an ongoing effort. Like it's gonna, we're just gonna keep working, but sure. Um, you know, the pandemic was especially hard in native communities. Yes. 20% yes. of fluent speakers passed away during the pandemic. Wait, 20%? Yep. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, I did realize that I marginalized people were disproportionately impacted by, by COVID-19. And I think you knew my dissertation chair is, uh, is Indigenous. He's Navajo. Mm -hmm. And he and I spoke co quite a lot uh, Yeah, during... Oh during COVID-19 um, about, about this very thing. And I'm so sorry those that 20% of the elders didn't make it. Yeah. But you know, it was kind of interesting. We did a big launch event for these books we were working on. Mm -hmm. And uh, Joe Naquin, AB Sr. was there. He's one of our speakers. And, you know, during the pandemic, he had a sister who passed away from COVID. He had a brother who passed away from a heart condition after contracting COVID. And I thought he would get up there and say, this is the hardest time of my life. And he just floored me because he got up there and he said, you know, we've been through a lot the past few years, but seeing all these young people rally around and work with our elders and what we've been able to accomplish, I, I think working on these books was the happiest time of my life. Oh my gosh. I know. So I'm like fighting back tears. I'm like, oh my God. You know, like, yes. yeah. How special, you know, and isn't isn't that it the, that the elder would the, that the elder could communicate that, and that's the piece, you know, the the wisdom of our elders and and how how in the indigenous world that is so much more valued is is so stunning uh, because because it's that kind of a voice that can come to us in calmness and in perspective to remind us that in every situation there is a place for growth and there is a place for introspection and and beauty uh in in what we what we do with the time whatever the time you know whatever the time has given to us you know with whatever challenge or, or blessing or gift yeah. yeah and i think we often get channeled into more narrow ways of thinking about professional work that it's yes you know, we're, we're thinking about what is the end product? Yes. So what is the copyright or the patent? You know, um, what's, what are the financial metrics like? And can I put it on my resume or not? Yes. You know, and, and things like that. And it was also just a very poignant reminder that like doing this kind of work, yes, there are these books and they'll have lasting value, but the process was something that was building up young people and it was very regenerative and healing for them. 
Yes. And also, it wasn't yes. a one-way street. It was regenerative and healing for our elders. Yes. And so yes. this process of like reciprocal healing, also producing things that have lasting value, that's pretty magical. Wow. And I think when you when you think about the connectivity of people, you know, and endeavors and higher purpose and all these sorts of things, um, there's some really special things that can happen. And when we look at the world today, you look at all of the traumas and injustices and oppressions, and there are yes. many different kinds. Yes. Economic, political, racial gender, sexual orientation, all these different things, you know, and people look around and feel so hopeless looking at what's happening in Ukraine or whatever. And I think ultimately, you know, although we, we do need to tune into and seek to intervene when there are oppressions and injustices, it's also important to remember that we are not powerless and we are not hopeless and right. that there are things we can do and there yes. are ways to overcome and heal from even the most horrible things that humans have been able to do to each other. Yes. And thinking about what does, you know, restorative justice look like? Not the punitive, but the restorative kind. What yes. does, you know, what does healing really look like? Right. You know, and right. there are many different answers to that. But to me, you know, the language and culture work are part of the answer on those things. Yes. And that's why, why I do them. And it's why I choose to live in my home community. I could triple my salary somewhere else, you know, but, uh, right. you know, for so many reasons, I, I've, you know, yes, my kids grow up with their, all their grandparents within 10 minutes of the front door. You can't put a price on things like that. They grow up with their cousins, you yeah. know, best friends like siblings you can't put a price on that stuff no. and i think sometimes we get so lost chasing dollars and prestige and profits that we yes. forget about all these other things and frankly for most of human yes. history until the dawn of the agricultural age for sure all of us lived in villages and we had earth-based worldviews and right. we survived whatever the challenges were not because we were out competing the person in the next cave, but because they loved us so much that they would intervene if there was a saber toothed tiger or a cave bear or something That's like that. That's right. It's the cooperate. Was the co I'm, I'm just like teary and misty now because of what you're talking about. It's moving my heart so much. Uh, it's so true because it it was a place of and time of cooperation, and and helping one another. Absolutely devoting to each other and not to a singular focus and a self focus. Mm -hmm. Right which is so, so beautiful. That's what's difficult, I think, for a lot of people feeling like we're more connected than ever, but people feel more disconnected than ever. And I think, you know, part of that is we are hardwired to seek connection, mm -hmm. belonging, mm -hmm. things like that. Right. Um, but our professional and political lives, at least for the Western world, are teaching us to disconnect and yes. focus on mission. Yes. You know, and yes. pour time into it. And yes. so we're working at odds with our most basic human needs. And so it's good to take a little step back and think about what are those most basic human needs. Yes. And are there ways to like feed your family and, you know, feed your soul? That's right. That's right. What you spoke of too, and I'll. I, I'll just, I'll say this out loud. It, it speaks to this intergenerational beauty and strength that happens with what you're talking about. And, and in our society, you know, when you spoke about the Ojibwe language being so respectful of elders, it, we do have a Western society that doesn't respect um, our, our elders in the same way that the indig indigenous um, um, worldview does. So as you speak of intergenerational um, relationships and that that's what you value and you value that for your children, it's so stunning and so wonderful. And, and I, I believe that too. Uh, my partner and I both have our parents close by where we are. And I spend time with my mom, um, you know, often and, and Tim does as well. Yeah, I, I just, I think it's so wonderful. And, and you speak too about, about things being important that just can't be quantified. 
it, nor mm -hmm. should they be, right? Uh, that that just the beauty of connection and loving and serving each other is is at the heart of it, and then and then honoring honoring who came before us is just stunning. Uh, I just this is just so precious. Uh, can you talk a little bit as we it, we've got we're at fifteen after, so we just have fifteen more minutes together. Uh, you have a, a beautiful wife and and beautiful children. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, your pride as a father and uh, you know as a son? But just I, I just I would love to hear more about about your family. Oh sure, yeah. I mean, being a parent is a terrifying job. You got, <laughs> you got one shot at raising your kid. The goal is not to mess them up, but you don't get any do overs mm -hmm. if you get it wrong. You know, <laughs> but mm -hmm. of course it's it's uh, crazy and. It doesn't matter what somebody tells you or how many books you read, you're never really fully prepared. Right. So, but, you know, at the same time, it has to be the greatest fountain of blessings, joy, purpose. Yes. It, you know, so motivating in so many ways. Yes. And, you know, I, I've tried to show my children, you know, our language and culture toolbox and to see some of what's possible has been really revelatory so my daughter madeline when she was born i said well that's it i'm only going to speak ojibwe to her and i would speak ojibwe to her all day and and then she'd wake up maybe age two crying in the middle of the night and she's crying around for milk and i'm like it's working <laughs> yes you know yeah. and uh, it was so funny watching her because she ended up being drug everywhere absolutely everywhere with me and i travel plenty mm -hmm. and we we're up in sault st marie michigan for this language conference there are about a thousand people in the room and over half were fluent speakers and sure i i was up at the podium doing a keynote address and she was i don't know three or four literally running in circles around me at the podium and then finally, her voice picked up over the microphone as she went running by saying, Hingy Boogit, which means I farted. And the whole place just burst into laughter and they couldn't hear anything I had to say the rest of the day. God, that's at hilarious. Time, at the same time, though, they were like, did you hear that little kid? She was speaking Ojibwe. That yes. Was awesome. How's that happening? Yes. We got to learn more about this, you know, and like. Um, to see she, whatever she did was far more impactful than anything I was thought was brilliant at the time. Yes. You know? And, uh, and so it's been really cool seeing like, she was actually part of the transcriber team working with the elders in Mille Lacs and stuff like that now. And wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. So I, I feel this kind of sense of like, something's happening as we're, I'm trying to hand the baton off, you yes. know, on some things. And now she is, I'm sorry to interrupt, but she, is she the, the daughter who's 10? No? no, this is, she's, a, she was my first born daughter. We oh, first born. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, she's all done, graduated from college and stuff like that. So, okay. yeah. So it's just cool to see what's possible there. And, you know, this happens not just with language, but with culture, you know, like one of our cultural customs when a child's born is we would bring a medicine to the hospital you know put some hot water in there make it into a tea strain it and use that for the baby's first bath okay and it you know it's a beautiful little simple ceremony instead of having nurses yes you know, product on um because when you're giving your baby's first bath you you're getting to know them you know like yeah. oh she's got hair on her back or whatever and right you know and you just fall in love with your kid and i i think when people fall in love with your kid you'll figure the rest of it out that's that's right you know that's and right. then we also would take like the placenta the afterbirth home mm -hmm. bring it out to the maple forest and bury it by a maple tree which is the tree. really yeah so that's kind of like since that's symbolically the tree of life it's like you know a symbolic gesture for long life healthy life for the baby Right. And we'll go in the spring out to the sugar bush and the kids are putting offerings by the maple trees where their placentas are buried. And then we're yeah. drilling little holes and we're harvesting maple sap and turning it into food and wow. you know, like getting life from the trees of life, you know, connected to the yeah. forest. And yeah, so I, to me, wow. you know, a lot of times people are like, wow, you guys spend a lot of time doing maple sugar harvesting. You're probably not making a lot of money doing that. Why are you doing that? 
you know, you seem like you're pretty busy. You can make more money doing gigs or something, you know, but it's not about the money, not about the money. It's about like, you know, now we've got sometimes like all the generations in our family are out in the woods, you know, doing this activity together. Yes. And there's a, a family tradition that's part of an age old tribal tradition. Right. And they've got a little cultural practice to do as their children are born, you right. know, and those sort of things are, are pretty, pretty powerful. Incredibly powerful. Gosh. That's really beautiful to hear about that. So you tell the listeners how many kids you have. You and your wife are amazing. We have nine children. <laughs> if anybody likes kids, let me know. We're always looking for babysitters. <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. You have used that line for years. <laughs> it doesn't really work. You know, <laughs> Yeah. once in a while, there'll be like a student be like, I, I will babysit your kids. I will rake your leaves like any <laughs> extra credit. You know, but they still haven't showed up. So uh, too yeah, funny, too line. funny, <laughs> too funny. Now at um, at Bemidji State University, you are a professor, but I would assume that you are the. I think you're the dean, though, of your area. Can you talk about? Not that titles are important because they're not, but I want the listeners to understand where you're serving and in what ways you're serving. Oh sure. So um, my title is professor of Ojibwe, and I teach Ojibwe language, um, history, culture classes. And we're in a department with Indigenous Studies, uh, which has a broader array of class offerings. And for a while, I was executive director of our American Indian Resource Center, but I abdicated that throne because my real passion is uh, teaching, and I felt yes. like spending too much time in yada yada meetings on other people's agendas. <laughs> yes, I, I got this. out of the administrative <laughs> stuff. But yes. uh, although it's mad respect for the position and anyone yes. who's in it, because it is important work. But um, yeah, I'm I'm very happy to to be doing what I'm doing. I'm I just got approved for a sabbatical for next year, and really? you know, our, our, yeah, our university is a little little stingier than some with sabbaticals, so I was pretty grateful to to get yes. it. Yes, and there'll be more projects that I'll be working on, and you know, even with the family stuff, we've been going through big transitions. My wife for a long time was a stay at home mom, mm -hmm. and you know, once all the kids headed off to college or headed off to school, you know, um, grade school or whatever, she was like, well, I guess they don't need me anymore. So I better figure this out. And she launched an art career and that really took <gasps> off. So she's- Oh, you know, fantastic. She's, yeah. What kind of art? She does um, textile art. So it, a lot of people don't know Wonderful. Exactly what that is, but she basically uses pieces of fabric, like the brush stroke- you know, for a canvas, it makes these portraits and they've been going all over the world. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. So we're, we're in transition. We got six kids out the door, three to go. And so some of what I'm going to do while I've got this year off, I've got some family and kid oriented things that I'm doing. Nice. And then, um, yeah, we're, I'm actually going to take the whole crew. We're going to go back to Austria, my father's country of origin and take wow. them around to his places and stuff nice. like that. So we're going to do a little bit of that too. And then, of course, lots of projects. Nice. So the pro when you say projects, you mean writing projects, more books? Mainly books, yeah. Super, super. And more of the kid books uh, or both? Kid books and um, and the adult versions of, of teaching. Oh, I've got, about, yeah, I'm just going to keep it top secret until it's out. Okay, no worries. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. Well, every everything everything you write is just fantastic. Can you uh, can you spell your last name for the listeners so that when they look you up, they can do it correctly? Sure, my last name is spelled T R E U E R. So I got the native guy with the German name Troyer, and it means true in German. Oh, wonderful. That is wonderful. And let's back up for a moment. I want to make sure you said that, you know, you always are looking for people to help inform the curriculum. What was the name of that organization? Creative Curriculum, was it? Uh, did you want to yeah. say that too for us? The Minnesota Partnership for Collaborative Curr Curriculum. Perfect. Minnesota Partnership for Collaborative Curriculum. Yep. Wonderful. And then that space, that's um, a nonprofit based in Minnesota. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, gosh, this is just so and wonderful. Your, you know, for your listeners too, um, on my website, for anyone who's interested, I've got a tab for resources and on resources for teachers, there's a list of indigenous authored books um, that are kind of broken into categories, history, young reader, different things like that. 
Um, there's resources for Ojibwe language. So that's got programs, publications, how to get a hold of Rosetta Stone, things like that. Um, you know, so there are lots of ways to get info. Uh, if you're interested in connecting with me, all my connection info is on there. Um, I've got a YouTube channel, lots of little video shorts and other free things that are easy for people to, sometimes they have questions, you know. Super. Do you do a land acknowledgement? How do you do that? You know, it's sure. on the YouTube channel. Fantastic. What's the, um, what's the website? Yeah, it's just my, my name. So it's antontroyer.com. A-N-O-N-T-R-E-U-E-R.com. Wonderful. Awesome. And then the, and then your YouTube channel is the same as yep. Anton Troyer. Yep. Perfect. Awesome. Oh gosh, this is, it's so fantastic to talk to you. The listeners should be able to tell that I have great admiration and respect for Dr. Anton Troyer. I did ask him to serve on our nonprofit, but as a busy, amazing human being, uh, he had to carefully contemplate that. And for this time, uh, we don't get his brilliance, but we still have his friendship and his support. And we're just in doing this podcast. So we are so thrilled with this. I, um, I'm just, I'm so honored to have you as a friend and for you to teach me what you have. Uh, your worldview is so very important to our entire earth uh, so that we are sustainable. I know that I was taught by um, Four Arrows, uh, Dr. Don Trent Jacobs, uh, in a beautiful video that he did called The World is Suffering, The Earth is Suffering, that, that the land that is still doing well across the globe is the land that's shepherded and cared for by indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And so we know that we know how important um, an indigenous worldview is for all of the reasons that you talked about today and uh, and for that reason as well. It just yeah, you're just so special. We so appreciate having you. If there's anything else that we missed and you want to share, we've got a little bit more time. Any yeah, I know you, we can't we can't hear from your upcoming projects. How many can I ask this though? How many years have you been at Bemidji State? Uh, 22. 22. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And then the title of your master's degree, going back to that for a, a moment, it was in history. Um, was the master's degree called history? What was the title of your master's degree? Oh, the master's was on Ojibwe Dakota relations. Okay. So some of that work, um, you know, I folded in with the Warrior Nation book, okay. uh, History of Red Lake Ojibwe. Although maybe there'll be another one to work on at some point in time. Sure. Super. Yeah. Super. And then the doctorate, then what was the title of your um, doctorate studies? Is it? History. History. Okay. Thank you. Just, yeah, it's just, it's always interesting to hear that, um, to hear what the specific is and then see where a person went, do you know, and how, how they evolved as a result of that of um of that inquiry yeah i have not stayed in a very narrow lane because i <laughs> you, you know end up doing all this language stuff and then i also do a lot of racial equity cultural competency work and a lot of that wonderful with educators and stuff like that wonderful that's fantastic that yeah. is fantastic the respect and love is mutual and i really appreciate the opportunity to be on your on your podcast and connect with your listeners and by all means i i hope they keep in touch Oh, thank you so much. You just, gosh, just keep up the amazing work. And thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Anton Troyer. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you for coming along on this journey through a conversation today on Sissy Mary Sue Education Fund's podcast called Educating Empathy. We just want to say, be well. We send you our love and our empathy. And I guess it's just until next time. <laughs>